right now we are just about ready for our third presenter. Uh, we've got Mr. Ashton Mpofu that is doing our third presentation. Um, Ashton is a senior water sector analyst at Green Cape and holds a master's degree in chemical engineering, cum laude, focusing on wastewater sludge beneficiation for resource recovery. He is currently a PhD candidate researching industrial wastewater treatment in the context of circular bioeconomy. He has worked in the water sector for over seven years and has expertise in research and development, wastewater treatment, water governance, market intelligence, consultancy, intellectual property, and the commercialization of teaching and training. Ashton has previously worked as a school teacher, a process engineer in the mining industry, uh, a research assistant, and a lecturer. Um, I want to read everything, um, but I will now go to the associations that you, I will now go to the associations that you belong to. Please stand next to me, Mr. Ashton. I'm, I feel very honored to be standing next to you because you've got such great credentials. So Ashton is a, a member of EXA. He's uh, also a member of uh, ICHEM um, and Psyche and uh, IWA, which is the International Water Association, and WISA, which is the Water Institution of South Africa. Um, Ashton, uh, over to you. It's very good to have you present in, in this uh, industrial water efficiency uh, track. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Che. I think um, I must uh, speak to the entertainment industry to afford you maybe an opportunity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you've done a good job uh, in keeping us entertained and um, I'm happy to be the last presenter and I think your audience is quite uh, live. So I think uh, it will be a good time to, to speak now. So good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once more and thank you for the kind introductions. I always say it makes me feel like as if I'm 50 year old, but I'm just a young man. Um, when they read your bio, uh, of course, I didn't write that. I don't have such good English of describing myself. Uh, but someone else had to do the pleasure and the honor of actually drafting that uh, for the purposes of such meetings and proposals and things like that. Uh, but I'm proud to say I'm a young man. Uh, I chair the uh, South African Young Water Professionals. So I think I always want to echo that. So uh, that uh, we applaud you for affording young people an opportunity uh, to speak and to be part of uh, you know, drafting a water secure future for South Africa. So thank you for having me. So I think uh, the previous speakers have really done a good job. My, my one would be a very simple one, uh, just to put everything into context. So I have also been banning seated there to answer some of the questions because these are things that I deal daily, uh, but maybe I'll reserve answering those questions and maybe let's speak at the end. So um, it's nice to see most of you again. I mean, I couldn't recognize some of you. Um, we haven't met in a long time and some of you couldn't recognize me as well. I guess I have... You know, but it's still me. It's still me. Uh, it took me a while to actually get to, to choose an outfit to come to this uh, place because nothing fits anymore. So this is the only suit that I have or jacket that I can wear, but the trousers can't fit anymore. So <laughs> you can imagine, but it's good to see some of you and even behind the mask, I can see it's you. Those that are online, um, um, I hope I'll meet you one day and please uh, join us at some point when you have an opportunity. So this is uh, the context of my presentation, just to introduce Green Cape. I know that uh, some of you up north, you really do not know us. Uh, yeah, Cape Town and uh, the rest of the country, we know the issues, but yeah, we are aware of that as Green Cape and we always want to spend some time to introduce ourselves who we are and the work that we do. And of course, I'll speak about the Cape Town drought uh, because my title is all about, you know, the work that Green Cape has done uh, in the Western Cape. I mean, NCP does most of the work this side, even the Western Cape, but they know that they have a partner in the Western Cape that is Green Cape. And then also to speak about the work that I've uh, said, and then also how did we achieve to some extent to build water resilience, which is very important for businesses. I'm speaking to you, a number of people have lost jobs, so I want to speak to that, how do we do that as Green Cape to ensure that uh, we don't close shop and people still have got jobs. So Green Cape is a non-profit organization, NPO or non-governmental organization, some will call it else in the, in, in the, in the continent. Uh, we drive the large scale, you know, or widespread adoption of economically viable uh, green economy solutions. So I always want to echo the fact that it's economically viable, right? So I wouldn't advise anybody to 
uh, you know, um, invest in something that is not economically viable. So all the technologies that we promote, we ensure they are green, uh, sustainable, they're good for the environment, and most importantly, uh, to whoever is purchasing them, the water users, business or industries that I'm speaking to today, they can afford it and it's economically uh, feasible or it makes sense. So we work with business, whether you are private, um, whether you are commercial, industrial, it doesn't matter. As long as you're a business, I'm there to work with you. I work with investors. So we publish what we call market intelligence reports uh, every year to highlight uh, the key investment opportunities or business opportunities in South Africa, but mainly we highlight in the Western Cape, Cape Town, and of course that can be escalated to the rest of the country. So we work with academia. We need to speak to you uh, about upcoming research or whatever you're doing. But most importantly, I need also to influence you to research in the right direction. We don't want uh, you know, too much publications for the sake of uh, promotions and whatsoever that are not really speaking to the industry or solving the problems that we have. So I'm there to say, hey, a company X or industry is suffering or is looking for solutions in this manner. So please start researching in this direction so that the government can also invest in proper research. So that's one of the things that we do. And we also work with government, of course, as we are sponsored by the Western Cape government. I mean, you did see from my title slide and also the city of Cape Town. So this work that I'll be presenting today is sponsored by the Western Cape government under the Department of Economic Development and Tourism and also the city of Cape Town as well. So yeah, this is us. And so we uh, help unlock the investment and employment potential of green technologies and services and to support the transition to a resilient uh, green economy. So we know uh, the thinking that people have that going green will lose jobs. It's not uh, investment savvy, it's not blah, blah, blah. But we're there to say, we want to ensure that, you know, going green, it makes uh, financial sense and investment sense to the economy. So we were established in 2010, initially, uh, after the energy crisis of 2008. So the Western Cape government thought, hey, we need to uh, look into renewables, you know, and then this is how King Cape, King Cape was started as a sector development agency, uh, looking into bringing renewables into the grid. Of course, thereafter, uh, as human beings, we, we love to respond when there's a crisis. You know, the water crisis came through. Uh, my team, the water team was also born from there. Now we've got the waste team, uh, we've got uh, the skills team and, and so forth. We've got a number of uh, green uh, programs within Green Cap. So our vision is to thrive, is a thriving prosperous Africa that is mobilized by the green economy. So we want our economy in Africa to thrive, to be prosperous, but we need uh, you know, the greening of it uh, to be behind that uh, success or prosperity. So as I've said, we work in the interface of a number of stakeholders in the value chain uh, just to ensure that we invest in green economically viable uh, infrastructure solutions and technologies. Uh, our ambition in the next five years, I mean, maybe now it's three years, is uh, aimed to be globally relevant in driving the uptake of green economy infrastructure solutions in the developing world uh, context. So this is who we are and this is the ambition that we have. So just to put to context uh, how we work, uh, we do some, have some research examples. As we can see, we move from internal to client facing. So on the research perspective, we do publish market intelligence report. I've written through of those in the last three years. Uh, we do industry brief and case studies that I'll go through uh, some of them today. We also field data through key relationships. So I come to your site, but I'll reserve that to the NCPC, but I do do that to some extent. Go to sites, speak to industries, get some data, get some insights, but of course, some of it I can't share. Uh, I have to ensure that, uh, you know, <laughs> I maintain it as confidential. Tools as well, uh, we have our Green Agri portal for the sustainable agri sector within Green Cap. So we have got some tools there for people in farming, if you want to know more or what can you do as a farmer. We have got decision making tools as well uh, in terms of waste and non-revenue water. And of course, my website will have a link to the NCPC, you know, to say if we have got other tools that you need, I don't have them as Green Cap, I haven't developed them, but you can go and get them from NCPC. We also assist when it comes to regulatory and legislative advice, you know, for example, tariffs of a municipality, the question about discharge, you know, how to go about things. I always tackle those on a daily basis. And uh, I know that uh, sometimes I need to make introductions. That's the work that I do. It's fine. But for any industry that is looking into investing uh, in any water work and you want to know about legislation, then I'm the first uh, shop that you come to, you know, then I'll see if I can provide you that information or resource. If I can't, then I'll refer you to somebody else because I'm in that interface, okay? 
Uh, then we've got the Green Business Support and Service Directory. So you can go in there. We've got a whole list of businesses or accelerators, incubators, funders, and so forth. Uh, I mean, NCPs will also find it there, you know, anywhere where you can get advice or you can get assistance for any problem that you have as an industry. We have a directory for that, you know, who is who, who can I contact for such things. We've got all the contact uh, list there. Then in terms of stakeholder engagement, uh, we do lots of uh, networking events. We do thought leadership presentations. I'm here today as well, you know, to try and strike you to think green. And thank you for the invitation again. We set up cross-sectoral and triple helix meetings. So I would hope you do understand the concept of triple helix. But in conclusion, before I go through the rest, you know, the things that we do, uh, I always summarize and say, if you think about green cap, it's difficult to understand what we do, but we, we just facilitate us in this space. So as you guys were speaking, I was already seeing myself, you know, playing a role. So if I haven't met you, then there's a problem. You know, you must ensure to meet during tea time. So we're just there, you know, as facilitators in the space. We're there to drive uh, the green economy. And we are also uh, what I refer to as playmakers in football or the rookie in rugby and things like that. So we're just there to ensure that all stakeholders speak with one voice and we don't speak in silos. So we're there to ensure that the green economy is being driven uh, nonetheless or one way or another. So yeah, we have got the WISP, Western Cape Natural Symbiosis Program. So this is all about the West. We're driving West away from landfills. I think that team has managed to drive away about 105,000 uh, tons of uh, West from landfill. So this is all about another main structure, another main treasure, you know. So I'll ask you what you do as a business, what you do produce as waste, uh, why are you taking it to landfill? Because your next business next door needs that waste, you know, as an input. So we try to drive away uh, landfilling and uh, we promote a circular economy or you know a continued use of, of, of products then we've got what we call the alternative service delivery unit so this is housed within the energy team um, uh, here we are trying to assist especially informal segments in terms of alternative sources like energy we help them to say uh, instead of waiting for esco informal segment will probably not give or get electricity because we're in a wrong place we go in there and assist them in terms of getting uh, solar uh, TVs as well, Wi-Fi and things like that. So this is like alternative services besides municipalities or government. We go in there with, uh, you know, funding from certain CSI activities and things like that. So we go in there and help uh, the people in informal segments. I mean, the team has done a lot. You can go to our website or YouTube uh, account to see what the team has achieved uh, in Akantis and uh, other places uh, in partnership with, the, with AXA, which is Airports Company of South Africa. So I'm speaking even in terms of water, we think about package plants as well, how do we afford sanitation to people in informal segments? So this is alternative service delivery. We do that through partnerships, you know, who's a tech provider, who can fund this work and which segment can benefit, which municipality can partner with and things like that. But it's all about being a facilitator. Recently, we've become the secretariat of the Plastic Pact. I know uh, the plastic economy. I won't go into that. Of course, start support that I'll be speaking a lot about today. And then also the Green Outcomes Fund, where we're speaking about, um, uh, you know, funding for green businesses uh, with the National Treasury and the World Bank. Um, this is our impact in the last 10 years. I'm told I'm not being audible. So we have facilitated about 42 billion rents in terms of investment in the green economy. We have uh, created about 19,000 local jobs and we have got more than 2,000 members in our uh, database. We are the first, of course, a member of the first uh, clean tech uh, cluster uh, network. So I think let me come to the meat of the day today, um, what I'm here for. So, of course, let me start about speaking about the drought of uh, 2014. Um, I think I have a pointer somewhere here. So we were hit by the drought in 2014, um, as you can see. Uh, I can't see it. Okay, it's fine. In 2014, so uh, we did not receive enough uh, uh, rain at that point. I mean, it's a reality for some of the provinces today, like PE or uh, uh, municipalities. And then we needed to do something as Green Cap. So between 2014 and 2019, the city of Cape Town was under drought. I mean, Goliath, uh, unfortunately, I didn't find your picture queuing to get water. But if I had it, I would have placed it there, you know. Uh, the chair. So this is what we were faced with in 2018, uh, which is at the heart uh, or the height of the drought. So we're told that we're approaching a day where we won't have water coming through our, uh, 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 you know, taps. We need to go and queue to get 50 liters per person per day. Uh, of course, that did not come to, to fruition. And I'll tell you why, because we're involved in green cap. 
So this is how we did it. So this is Green Cap's work in building water resilience. This is the approach. So firstly, at the bottom there, you talk about uh, developing resilience partnerships and networks to encourage collaborations. So I need to ensure that all of us speak with one voice. So we need to collaborate, we need to partner. We should stop working in silos because the major problem in the water sector in South Africa, everyone is doing their own thing, we're not speaking to one another. We are addressing the same thing over and over again, but if we begin to speak, and if Green Cap is in that interface to ensure that you speak with one voice, then we can have collaborated efforts in solving our problems. Number two is prioritizing and uh, coordinating. So, I mean, he did present about an approach, you know, starting with metering and so forth. So, after we understand the problem and we need to prioritize what should be looked at first, then other things will look at them later, or even resources and finances and things like that, we need to prioritize and coordinate. Number three, now we need to drive the uptake of realistic short-term solutions. So this is what we're doing when we're um, engaging the industries. Um, and then I will speak about uh, this tax team that was set up during the trial, which is called the Economic Resilience Tax Team. Green Cape was a part of it. We had the Western Cape government, we had the city of Cape Town, we had uh, the NBI, um, we had West Grow, and uh, quite a number of others. So these were stakeholders from industry, we had academia, uh, with uh, tourism, you know, with government on the regulatory side. So we wanted all uh, the, you know, interested or I can say concerned stakeholders that will ensure that you don't get to D0 to come in one room and we speak. So you are for investment, you know, how can we benefit you? You know, you are for industry, how can you benefit from this? You are industry yourself, how are you affected and how can we assist you? Is what we are proposing to be a solution to you, does it make sense or not? Because people have got a tendency of, you know, not consulting, but uh, communicating solutions without consulting the concerned parties. So we needed to have all those people in one room and we didn't speak, you know, and we negotiate. Of course, there will never be, always be, you know, one understanding. So sometimes there's friction, but at the end of the day, uh, we always want to say the green economy wins, you know. <laughs> so even if you're ahead, but at the end of the day, the green economy will win. So number four is building knowledge and capacity for long-term solutions. And now that you understand, you said we're in a crisis, Let's solve this for now, but going forward, and they've predicted, they've spoken about the uh, demand of tripping supply, what can we do? That's how you build resilience into the future. So capacity building, collaboration in local tech and services. So you need to look at the technology within our ecosystem. You know, I mean, I've got tech providers here. We need to speak to them, understand what are they providing, you know? And then we need uh, water users, which is the industry, to say, does this make sense to you? Can you afford it? You know, do you think it will work? Government, can you incentivize, you know, do you think we can implement this and things like that? So we need all these voices in one room so that we, we ensure that we become resilient. So we coined what we call the water resilience journey as Green Cape. I mean, I think Rulani did touch on it, whereby we said to the industry, the first thing that you need to understand is your water use and risk, right? So we talk about any industrial user, you know, first understand how you use your water. You know, now that you're not going to have water, how are you going to be affected? How much water do you use? So that information is very important. You can't uh, save what you don't measure. You can't manage what you don't measure. So this is the information that we're communicating. So the simplest technology that we're communicating was metering. He spoke about a 15-year-old analog meter that is rusted and it's not even working, but a municipal official comes and takes the readings, probably the same number every time. They're like, no, it's not working. They estimate. Now the businesses are screaming. Why am I always being charged so many thousands every day? Some people charge millions <laughs> as residents. So like, how can a resident be charged a million? Water was leaking for that particular household or something. Like, these are realities in South Africa. So we're saying to them, look into smart metering. You know, we have got good uh, smart meters, you know, can have them on your mobile and so forth. Water quality requirements. Not everyone needs portable water. You know, this is what we're telling businesses. Why do you want to use portable water, drinking water for flushing? I mean, we, we uh, almost all of us did it today. We use portable water to flush our toilets, but we don't need portable water to flush your toilet, you know? So there's a solution. What can we do? You know, so these are things that we're being discussed. So we first say, understand that and set water targets. If uh, Coca-Cola says to make one liter of Coke, it takes so many liters benchmarking, why is your business uh, using three times that amount? You know, they say in the world, people are using about 150 something whatsoever liter per capita per day. Why are we in South Africa using 272? So those are the questions that we're asking, you know. So number two is say you reduce consumption. Now that you understand where you, you're losing most of your water or where your leakages are and so forth. Now we say, how do you reduce your consumption? So that's what we're communicating. We talk about efficient technologies. We talk about them 
uh, do we know them? Yes, no, but we need tech providers in the room to say, okay, this is what we can supply, this is what we can provide, right? And also efficient fitting. So these were short term, you know, to say, business is what can you do, you know, because we will reach day zero, you have to close shop, people lose job, the economy will suffer, but how do we do, you know, what can we do to ensure that we don't close shop? The number three now, if the first two steps have been done and we're convinced and we still want to build resilience, you speak about reusing water, you know, so this is where you are speaking about alternative water, you know, your rain water harvesting and so forth. But I'll come to those and talk about them in a, in a, a, a deeper detail. So grey water, treated effluent, diverting water for reuse and so forth. So these things are possible, but you also need some tools from NCPC, some tools from other people. You need the reports that John Zimba was talking about on, 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 on the question, the comment, that was a question. Uh, we have got those resources from Water Research Commission where we benchmarked all the industries in South Africa, you know, um, you call them the NADCEFs. So they were benchmarking, telling how industries are performing, where are they using water, how are they treating their waste water and so forth. So that was also important to being in the awareness and understanding about water uses in South Africa. And then that, that uh, particular document also advises on, you know, what can you do, uh, PATs and, and so forth that Ron was speaking about. Then finally, you can find an alternative water source. If the municipality is saying you will reach day zero or you think of a risk one day that even in the future, the municipalities might be unable to supply water. Whether we are under scarcity or because of institutional failures. <laughs> so those are two different things. So if you read the National Water and Sanitation Master Plan, our crisis is not only because of climate change. We have got a lot of other issues, maybe a, a point for discussion at the end. So you think about that as a business. These are your risk as a business, then you end up saying, okay, off grid, uh, like they do the electricity. So we'll be there to advise you. So these are my examples. So these are some of the businesses that we, have, we did engage uh, during those days. And they were happy to share, you know, um, their journeys or they were happy to share what they achieved. Uh, so that's why I have their names there. Uh, but unfortunately, the tech suppliers who supplied or who did the services, I, I won't tell you, <laughs> but this is what happened. So the first one is extend meats. So they say supply package meat, actually. So what they had to do is they had to look into smart metering and sub-metering within their facility. So as I have said, that it must make economic sense. So they invested, uh, you know, uh, about 361,000 rents into this uh, smart metering and sub-metering. Uh, then what happened is that um, they were able to take clicks and so forth within the system. They uh, saved about uh, 1.5 million rents, you know, through uh, going back and uh, blacking the leaks and also reducing consumption because they understood where they're using too much water, right? So you have to speak this language. Internal rate of return that you spoke about 20% and above, they're happy to invest. So you need to do these calculations for them and tell them that this makes business sense. Business people understand money. Business people understand the word profit. If you chat to them and try to convince them about green and you don't speak about money, you're wasting your time. So this is where we come in and say, okay, listen, let's negotiate. Give or invest so much. Within two months or two years, you'll be able to get your money back. Then they smile. You know? So this is what you're talking about. So if you look into savings as well, you save from consumption in tech, you know, from the municipalities. And you know, the way the tariffs are, are structured, when you're under drought or constraint, water becomes more expensive, and that's when you save more. You know, but in this instance, these guys were able to save about uh, you know 1.1 million uh, rents through implementing this. And then we have got the growth point properties as well. The estuaries office park they achieved about 70% water savings, largely due to uh, installation of smart metering. So on average, just implementing smart meters, you can save about 40% of your consumption just by buying a smart meter that costs you less than 2,000 rand, you know, it's available. It will save you about 40% consumption. So he spoke about, was it the chair, that at night you close shop on a Friday, you go on a weekend, but you come back, you find that someone was using your electricity, someone was using your water, you know. So if you have a smart meter, you can, you can see from the graph at the bottom, a water leak, you see, it was straight line on the green one. So it means there was a leak because when they down shop, they go home or they close after five, still water consumption, there's water being used by someone. There's a cost in that factory, you know? It's a leakage. But you put a smart meter, then it will tell you that there's a leakage. You plug the leak, you get a new graph, you know, pulsating on, off, on, off. So that's what they did at the Code Point uh, uh, office park. The second one is, of course, JG Africa. They also did the same by, you know, um, putting air So these are short-term solutions, you know? 
instead of opening your tap or you are going to brush your teeth, then water is just gushing out. So you reduce the flow by installing these aerators. So now water is spraying. Even washing your hands, you use less. So these are some of the things that especially commercial businesses were doing in their bathrooms, shower heads and so forth. They were buying and installing these efficient shower heads and aerators. And it was uh, able to save them about 67%, you know, even through awareness, speaking to your workers and advising them how to, you know, to use water within the operations. Of course, uh, my engineer did go very technical about this stuff. I'm more on a high level and speak about money and so forth. But you know what you have to do. So aerators, directional spray nozzles, some businesses, they do washing within the business and you find them using a lot of water, you know, for washing. But now you say there are alternatives to washing. Uh, nowadays, we're using sanitizers instead of washing hands and soap. So maybe stop washing hands and use a sanitizer. It serves the same purpose and you save water. So those are some of the things that were happening. Some malls that we engaged stopped using water. Uh, we now go in as a sanitizer. Before COVID, you know, Cape Town malls were now using sanitizers and so forth. Uh, automatic shutoff valves and sensing devices. So if they still maintain that they want to tap in a mall, there is a sensor now. Instead of you opening and chatting to your friend uh, about the soccer match whatsoever and the tap is running on, now it senses you that you have moved away, it stops. So this is what uh, people are installing and what people are saving or uh, were investing in. So you got water, waterless cleaning and processing. So some businesses can actually go waterless. You don't need to use water for washing or cleaning your products whatsoever. So we advised, you know, guys stop using water at all and let's focus on waterless cleaning and processing. I mean, in terms of cooling towers, of course, you can go air cooling than using cooling towers. Those are some of the advice that we gave them. Of course, you have to communicate the business case and whether investing in that will bring money back on a short term or not. So the business can have a, a meeting in AGM, they discuss the funds with the CFO. Can we invest or not? Yes or no? Then we go. And then, so if you look at JG Africa, of course, they invest about 33,000 rent, which are simple, you know, in those aerators and shower heads. Uh, total capital investment, the, those are annual primitive savings, sorry, but they invested 18,000 rent. But at the end of the day, they could save about 730 kilometers, you know. So if you look at the tariffs in Cape Town at the time, I mean, at uh, level six, I believe, we're paying almost around 40 to 50 rent a kiloliter, you know. So you save a lot by just putting air at us. So these were the things that we were communicating at the time. And also there's a graph that shows, you know, what exactly they were saving on urinals and things like that. And then the next one is water reuse. So now that we have done smart metering, we know how we are using water or losing water. We have now reduced our consumption through short term. Now we talk about water reuse. So now we talk about gray water, black water, industrial effluent reuse. So one example is bleaching active. You know, um, they reduced their water usage by 62%, which is about 12.6 uh, megaliters a day um, through ablution facility retrofits and alternative water and gray water treatment plants. So, you go to the gym, you want to take a shower, you know, you want to wash and things like that. So Vision Active decided to say, okay, we need to find ways of using uh, efficient systems. Instead of a system that uses 12 liters to flush, now you've got a dual flush. So we used to communicate a, a, sort of like, you know, a saying to say, when it's yellow, let it yellow. When it's brown, let it down. That's what I'm talking about. So the, some of the things that they had to do now, they had to put uh, retrofits. We have been communicating of putting a brick in a system. You know, basics, physics, uh, density and, 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 and mass and volume. Just put a brick, it will raise your water. When the system is filling, it won't fill 12 liters anymore, maybe nine. But now we've got a standard, of course, through SAPS that there should be, I think, maximum of nine. So, yeah, they invested 24 million, which was a lot, and, but they had a payback period of about one and a half years. You know, so it was easy to tell them, guys, Theoretically, this is what is going to happen. You convince them, they invest, they see their money back. Today, as I speak, they're making profits <laughs> or more savings. Uh, quality beverages, these are Jive manufacturers, that uh, um, soft drink manufacturer. So they started using their um, uh, wastewater for cleaning the floors. You know, So they will wash the bottles when they come through for refilling with your cold drink. Now we'll tell them that water, don't just throw it away. Just use it for cleaning floors. You know, after your, your shift, you need to clean the floors, keep it sanitized and blah, blah, blah. Don't use tap water. Use your wastewater from washing your bottles. And here they are, 27% 20, wastewater production. They save 61% and they save about 3,000 kiloliters a month, which is 3 ml uh, per month. Uh, 285,000 a month by reusing that rinse water. 
So it's a lot. I mean, if you're able to save about 280,000, you know, speaking about 2017, I don't know how much it is now. I mean, it's, it's good savings. And then last one, of course, is uh, the wine estate. Uh, now they are using a package plant. They used to use a septic tank. Now they installed a package plant that uses your anaerobic membrane bioreactor. And now they are able to produce 10 kiloliters that can then be used for irrigation. So instead of using borehole or municipal water to irrigate the estate, now you are using your effluent from your wine cellar cleaning and even from your domestic workers, uh, toilets and uh, you know, ablutions and washing facilities and things like that. So average monthly waste water disposal, 40,000 rent. Capital cost of a new plant was just 1.1 million. That's what they invested. Payback period of three years. Uh, monthly savings after payback, so it's that one. So after the payback product has come to, to fruition, every uh, month going forward, they will be getting 31,000 extra in their pockets. You know, So this is a good uh, deal or something that is good to, to go into. So tech providers, this is the language that you have to communicate. When you speak to your water users or your industries, when you go to them and looking for business, communicate this language, then they will understand you better. But if you come and tell them about the green economy and saving the environment and blah, 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 uh, the wastewater is dead, it doesn't meet the standards, you become an enemy. Myself, I'm even worse when I come there because I'm, I'm sometimes misunderstood. Who do I represent? You know, am I a, a spy or something? You know, now I need to tell them who I am and I'm there to help them, not to, uh, you know, do anything else. Okay, then lastly, uh, you can look at alternative supply. You know, instead of dependence on the water municipality, or trying to save what you get from the municipality, some can go off grid partially or fully, right? So we're talking now rainwater harvesting, we're talking about groundwater use, we're talking about atmospheric water, you know, these uh, condensers, condensed water vapor into water. We're also talking about desalination and trade effluent, you know? Some of these things are far at the far end because they're so expensive to implement, you know, not small businesses will never venture into this. But when it comes to groundwater, Keptonians, when we are about to hit day zero, everyone was drilling a ball. Everyone. That's the fear that comes to mind. We are going to run out of water. There's water underground. Let's drill. Right? But that water also, you know, is not fit for human consumption. Some of it is full of metals. I mean, there's a study that has been done by WWF. Our Kepflet's water is full of metals. Our Table Mountain Aquifer is full of metals. So sometimes it's not usable. Even for irrigation, there are standards that you have to meet. You can't just drill and, you know, some don't even register their poles. So we are doing something about that that I'll share a bit later. So that's what was happening at the time. But uh, a good example is the Deppenville uh, farms, uh, just uh, very close to where I stay. So these farmers decided to say, instead of drilling boreholes, they are now going to use trade effluent from the municipality. So the city of Cape Town now supplies uh, wastewater from treatment works uh, to some industries. Firstly, to the farmers in Debenville, they love that water because they've got nice nutrients, right? Instead of using groundwater and buying a fertilizer, they're now saying, if I buy wastewater, there's a little piece of nutrients and I save on fertilizer and so forth, even on you know, uh, maintaining a pole and things like that. So the city of Cape Town is supplying them at a rate of 740. You know, potable water is about 27 rand at the moment. We are at zero uh, level. Then Century City, you know, I'll come to that case study now. And then Astron Energy, which is former uh, Chevron. They get water from one of the treatment works, you know, for uh, um, processing uh, your, your oil, you know. So they use uh, wastewater from a municipality than using potable water. Levi jeans, some of you may be wearing them. They also went off grid. So they are buying water from the city in Epping industrial area. The city is now put a pipeline all the way to that industry in the Epping area. Instead of using portable water, most of the industries there, including tenneries, uh, Richard Kane and, uh, and Levi's, they now use uh, wastewater from, from, from the municipality for their processing. So this is what we can do. Alternative supply, you can go off grid with this, uh, but we mainly mainly, mainly advise for non-portable purposes. If you want to take this water and treat to portable standard, you need to meet SANS 4.1 and you need to become a water service intermediary. Now you invoke and invite DWS to be your friend and also municipality. So there are uh, legality issues or water use license that can take you 90 days these days, but long back it was about a year plus, you know. And then 
just to give an example now, Bayside Mall, they decided to implement water harvesting and storm water. So you can enter into an agreement with the city of Cape Town to harvest from their storm water drainage system. You know, even discharging again, if you want to discharge there, you need to get authorization. So these guys decided to use that water for non-portable purposes. So they reduced their consumption of portable water by 93%. Annual savings of about 200,000 rents and they invested about 1.5 million. Payback is a bit high, five years, but the entire rate of return is 20%. So we know if you do renewal harvesting, your payback will take longer, basically five to eight years, you know, because it's rainfall, <laughs> it's seasonal, you know. If we don't have rain, we don't have rain, your tank will be stuck empty, you know. So, but some people love doing it, and we've got technologies that we can discuss during tea, where people are doing now uh, vertical farming, you know, or like uh, porous um, slabs or porous flooring that can allow water to go down and be stored underneath. It's sort of paving, which is also something that we need to discuss because maybe these floods is because we have paved everywhere, you know, so water does not really penetrate and go to our underground. So it's a discussion during tea. Um, then Rabi, this is the Century City guys now. So they decided to take a uh, wastewater effluent from post dam uh, treatment works. They are using that for toilet flushing, urinal flushing, irrigation, and for their cooling towers. So at the moment, they've offset about 2.3 million a, a year you know, in terms of water. They are saving about 44 megaliters of water, you know, uh, that is based on 21, uh, 2021 tariffs. So this is a big, big uh, shopping center and so forth. So now they don't use portable water. And through that, you can see 2 million rain saved every year. Uh, they were awarded the Foster Mixed Use Rating, of course. We've got the Green Building Council of South Africa. Now some businesses do this because they want to become a green building. So they have been certified as a foster. Then um, one other thing that we had to do, you know, speaking to the city of Cape Town and, you know, through other stakeholders as well, was to look into our regulations, which is something that you need to touch on as well, to build resilience. If people can't volunteer, eh? if people can't volunteer, we force them. As long as we see it's a good thing, we'll force you by uh, installing bylaws or guidelines and so forth. So the new... 2018 amendment bylaw for the city of Cape Town requires that each and every property development must have a sub-meter. So if you stay in a complex, this issue of having one meter for the whole complex, we divide by the area or you divide by the number of households, it's not fair because if Linda, Lindan is using more water, he has got eight people in the house in a two-bedroom flat, I stay alone, I go on holiday in Venda, I'm gone for two years, but I still pay. So the city is saying to know who's using more water and to be efficient, let everyone have an independent dedicated meter for your household. So that's what you're talking about. And then also um, each and every new property development, you now uh, required to have demonstrated in your planning that you are going to save water. So as you submit your plan for your new property development, you must see that somewhere somehow this new facility he has got water savings in mind, okay? Be it uh, rainwater harvesting, uh, be it uh, porous floors or storages and so forth, but we need to demonstrate that your new building does think about the environment and the fact that we're a water scarce country. So that is it. So we have those as well. And if you want to go off-grid alternative water, yes, we allow you. Go alternative water, but we need to ensure that your alternative water does not mix with the municipal water. Otherwise, you'll go and tell people that Cape Town water is not suitable for consumption. And we had the hawks a few months ago when I told that Cape Town water has got typhoid. I think it was typhoid or something like that, but it wasn't true. So the Blue Drop reports have reported that that water is suitable for consumption. So to avoid that, the city says uh, you must follow the sun standard. Uh, put an RPZ valve, no reverse, so that we don't mix portable and the alternative supply. So I'm talking about grey water, I'm talking about rain harvesting, I'm talking about black water, your, your water from your toilet, you know, you can treat that for non-portable purposes. So you need to apply to the city of Cape Town if you want to implement all these things, then they'll approve you. So at the moment, we are looking at package plans uh, for new property developments, you know, but all these things need to go through the city to assess if they'll allow you to install a package plant whilst they are building uh, the centralized treatment works. So this is the work that they are dealing with nowadays um, to try and uh, allow people to install uh, package plants. 
then this is the summary of all the work that you did from uh, during the drought up to today. And this is what you're advising people uh, in terms of building long term. And I've got two examples for you. One is your favorite uh, 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 tourist destination or your favorite place that you go to when you come to Cape Town, I'm sure, the VNA waterfront. So the VNA has done a lot since I think 2010. They started off with smart metering, installing aerators, uh, changing their cooling towers to use uh, alternative water or to use air until now that they've recently installed a desalination plant. So to some extent, uh, there's a case study on our website. If you go to the waterfront, go to their bathrooms, uh, wherever you go, just be aware that uh, all those things, they've done a lot in terms of water saving. So this is one example of a holistic approach of taking the whole resilience journey from the start to the end where you implement alternative water. So I'm speaking about, uh, you know, um, savings of about 7 million over 10 years. Um, they invested 7 million over 10 years since about 2010. And today they have saved about 40 million as the VNA waterfront. So this is massive savings from such a big entity. You know, waterfront is very big. Um, and then 127 hectares, as you can see. Uh, if you talk about the nice uh, bus, I put in the last uh, slide so that you can come visit Cape Town. Um, <laughs> so they reduce the water consumption, you know, from 8,000 to 20 liters a day. Imagine you're using eight kiloliters. You're reducing that to 20, 20 liters, just a bucket a day. After one soft investment of 380,000 in water efficient technologies and desalination. So they installed a desalination plant at the end of the day. Uh, they had a payback period of only 16 months. So this is my graph to show you what happened short term. Uh, we did knowledge and behavior change. We looked into water conservation demand management. We talked about smart metering, uh, also water restrictions. We forced them by putting water restrictions to the city of Cape Town. Uh, there were also incentives uh, to some extent. If you save so much, you know, there are lots of schemes like that. Um, yeah, so that was the short term and you can implement those within a year or two. Then medium term, people looked into groundwater, but we are now advising sustainable groundwater use because not all about abstracting whatever you want, we must limit you because groundwater is our storage as a country. I mean, you're learning a lot from Denmark and we're in partnership working on that called the Tepu Mountain water source partnership. So we sit there as Green Cape just to try and advise on sustainable water use, trying to implement the water and sanitation master plan that we need to use more of groundwater, but sustainably. Um, then we've got municipal reuse where those farmers, Astron Energy and other businesses are now using treated effluent. Uh, also talk about water sensitive design. So now when you are designing your house, please be water sensitive. We want to see those nature-based solutions, good architecture that thinks about water scarcity. So these are things that are implementing in medium term. Long term, let's reduce the cost of desalination. I mean, we know about energy usage in a desalination plant is quite expensive, but South Africa has got enough water. We don't have enough fresh water, but we have got enough water if you talk about our oceans and if we also implement water reuse. So those are long term and they apply to the whole country. We have got uh, technologies, we have got people that are innovative, I think we can do it. If uh, the Middle East are doing it, they consume diesel water, why not South Africa? But we need to make sure that the costs are minimal. We don't have oil money <laughs> to just do that. Then interventions and water use, uh, this is what happened in the city of Cape Town, just as I close my uh, presentation. Uh, early days was all about building to supply. You know, the population is growing, build more dams, get more water for, to the people. Came year 2000, uh, Kata Asmal, we had to reduce because there was a drought at that time. We reduced, but the truth of the matter is the fact that the consumption kept on going up, if you look at uh, the graph. 2015 came, another drought hit us, which is the work I've been presenting now. We managed to reduce our water consumption by 50% in 18 months, one and a half years. This took uh, Melbourne in Australia, I think five years to achieve a 50% reduction in water use, but the city of Cape Town achieved it in 18 months. And I'm proud to say that Green Cape was part of that. Um, at the moment, uh, if I were to extrapolate that graph, it's going up again. <laughs> People have relaxed because we are told that we have got plenty of water, consume as much, and it's now cheaper because the tariffs have been lowered. So people have forgotten that we are a water scarce country. So this is uh, the um, conclusion from the Green Cape side. We say that we, our you know, web page on green business support was the number one visited during the days. 
So if we look into people always going to a green, um, you know, to get out, uh, business support. So we interacted with about 400 businesses. We managed to save about 76% through, you know, uh, preaching that gospel of water saving, you know, uh, investing in water uh, technologies and so forth. So in total, we managed to save about 76%. And in terms of jobs that were safeguarded, 58,000. So those 58,000 people might have been out of job if those companies had to close down. So that's what you're talking about. But we know the impact that it out had on the agri-processing industry in Cape Town. So it was to a massive amount of about 3.4 billion rand that was lost uh, from the agri-processing industry. And then average reduction in consumption uh, per facility was about 41%. And then uh, the amount that was invested, you know, so the tech suppliers can smile because they benefited from this. You know, that 120 million, they were buying <laughs> technologies and services from the suppliers. So that's what we managed to attract. So if you break it down in terms of specific uh, details, the monitoring and measurement, that is smart metering, we managed to reduce by 73%. And implementation of efficient behavior, air rates and so forth, we reduced by 73% again. Reuse of water on site, 66%. And alternative water sources, groundwater, uh, rainwater, and blah, blah, blah it was uh, to a tune of about 79%. So what are we doing uh, going forward? Uh, this is my daily uh, work at the moment. So my colleague, Jane, she was the one that was uh, the contact person for the drought. Uh, but yeah, that is not really uh, a form of you know, core business at the moment, but we do what you call water sector desking. Uh, that falls under my portfolio. So all I do is to engage all of you, as I've spoken, you know, just to ensure that we um, realize the importance of water saving. So this is where patch during the drought is still active, right? So you come in there, you want to get a list of water tech providers. If you're a water tech provider, you're not in my database, I need to speak to you. Uh, for the water users, that this is the core conference for you. You come here, you want a diesel plant, you want to know who's supplying it. You click there, it will give you a list of all the suppliers across the country that I have in my database. I don't guarantee that the, those that I have, they are certified by GreenCap, no. Those are the people that have come to GreenCap and said, we supply this, we engage them. But for you, as an industry, you have to do your due diligence in some of these businesses and check them and their uh, you know, uh, business. Are they good people to go into business or partnership with or not? And then we also have um, the Western Cape one, so local. Western Cape suppliers, we have got a database as well. So people come in here and get all this. For events, I mean, anyone in the country that was having an event that was speaking about water saving and so forth, we'll list them there, you know, the dates and registrations and everything, just to support you as a business to come click. You want to learn about this, attend that event. Case studies, they are also there, free of charge. It's already been paid for. Western Cape government and the city of Cape Town, we don't charge you for all this work. It's sponsored. Also, the tools for NCPC, unfortunately, it's a screenshot. There's a uh, link there, you know, if you want to access the NCPC website about all the guide guidelines and tools. Water Research Commission um, the resources as well, we have a link to those. So this is where you can get all the resources I've presented today, industry briefs, um, and, and, and the case studies that I've gone through. They are there online. And then these are the nuts that Mr. Dr. John Zimba was speaking about, the comment that was a question that was a comment. So you can get these as well on the website of the Water Research Commission. Uh, I managed to do one myself for the tenary industry. So you can ask me about that, I'll tell you, you know. Yeah, I think I've come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ashton, indeed you are a very good speaker. I was sitting here, I know it's lunchtime now, I just want to say the following. Uh, I often say to my wife, we need to go to church this week because uh, the soul is feeling very dreary. And then when you go to church, you come to Tuesday, Wednesday, you say, we need to go to church again. The soul is feeling very low, dreary. And you get that feed from spiritual feed and you're feeling good. My brother. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, I have my full of, of water charge after your presentation. I think we can give Mr. Ashton another... Round of applause for a very, very good presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, 
We are on the lunch hour, but I ask very kindly if we can maybe just spend one or two minutes just addressing those uh, uh, questions that we that we left unanswered. And then from there, we can decide if we want to continue the conversation through the, through the lunch hour. But let's do us our favor and not just close the session now. Let's spend maybe five to 10 minutes in just wrapping up nicely and that taking questions um, through the discussion and, and so forth. So the first thing that I want to just um, highlight mm -hmm. is my colleague Linda Lani Makiza asked a question earlier. Mm -hmm. And please accept my apology. Uh, we did not address your, your question formally. His question was, what are the other what are alternatives uh, to rainwater harvesting that people can use out there, um, especially in this case in context of where there were floods, etc. I'm very happy, Mr. McKeezer, that I have not answered your question, even if it was unintentional or inadvertently, because Mr. Ashton has done that so gracefully in his presentation. So I see your head is nodding. So you are, your spirit also has been filled from a water context. So we are very happy. Um, the gentleman that asked the question about the uh, legislature for wastewater quality, etc. You want us to take that conversation a bit further because the speaker that was on now uh, enticed us a, li a little and said that he is the prof. The, the expert in that field of answering your question. Mr. Essen, do you want to come forward and just share some of your expertise to the uh, gentleman who asked the question? Yeah, I think you put Denmark, right? Yeah. If, yeah. If, we, if we can get a, a mic to the gentleman, just to repeat his question very briefly, we are running out of time. Then Mr. Ashton, I know you are a very good speaker. If we can keep the response very succinct, uh, okay. then we can, we can all win. And precise. Thank you, thank you, sir. <laughs> So I'm from Belgium. But I think I got his question. Do you want to do it for the audience? Yes. Can we just repeat the question very briefly, please, for the audience? Yes. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, compliance of uh, discharge water. Uh, to which extent this is, this is happening on a regular basis in, in South Africa? Because it's such an important uh, aspect. I'm from Belgium. Yes. We... We currently, and in the past, we had a big problem of, uh, of, of contamination of, of one of our most important rivers uh, in Belgium, in Antwerp exactly, with uh, PFOS, which yeah. is uh, a product which you basically, is very difficult yes. to get it out of the water, even uh, big contamination of our soils. Um, so, and this is a, a compliance issue, yeah, and, and a non-compliance by, let's say, one factory can have an impact of decades yes. Yes, on, 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 on your water and on the, the soil around it. So, I'm uh, interested to hear how that uh, compliance and the inspections, how they work mm. uh, in South Africa, and, and if this is really done at a regular basis, or is this done at an ad hoc basis? Uh, because then there are quite some dangers. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think I'll try not to be very negative uh, about our country. Uh, I'll try to sweeten my, my response. Uh, maybe in a nutshell, what happens is if you speak about a business, you know, it comes back to where are they discharging their water to, right? So if they discharge to a municipal sewer, which is a privilege, if in an open context, then the jurisdiction to ensure that you discharge water that is of good quality uh, lies within that municipality. But we know South African municipalities are dysfunctional, right? So implementation of those bylaws, those are called what you call bylaws. So there's a bylaw, right, that we have to comply with that states all um, the parameters that you must comply with. Unfortunately, we don't measure PFAS at the moment. We only hear about it in the conferences. We are not measuring that in South Africa at the moment. So if it's there, uh, rest assured we are very strong people because he hasn't killed us okay so and then if you as a municipality take that water you treat it yourself since it has been touched by a, a business then our national department of water and sanitation now says to the municipality where are you going to discharge after treating that water is it to the ocean which you call sea outfalls is it to um, you know river or any water catchment so the municipality now needs a license between itself and the national department. So it's each one look for each other. DWS, they look into the municipality, you know, unless if you as a business, you are discharging, you know, directly into the environment, then you deal with DWS. There's no municipality because not using a municipal sewer. 
attached to the environment, we have got National Water Act. There are parameters that you must meet based on your volume and 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 you know where you are discharging to. If you touch to a river, we have special limits for certain rivers, but some is just generic. So we have got an act for that. Um, that's how it is done. And then um, the municipalities, I've said now, they need to comply with TWS because TWS has to look after municipalities. But here's the iron of the matter. So if I look to ensure Lindani does the right thing, Lindani has to make sure that, uh, I forgot your name, but I'll use <laughs> Lindani. Lindani does the right thing. So we are policing each other now. But at the end of the day, I, standing as the national department, must ensure that the South African resources and even environment is, is conserved and is protected, right? So this is how our legislation works. We have got legislation for that, but implementation is a problem because it's not a secret. I will tell you now, it's public knowledge. DWS is undercapacitated. You know, they've got lots of open jobs that have not been filled in a long time. Same applies to DFFE. So we have lots of people not, that are not complying with the discharge standards and nothing is happening to them. I'm happy one municipality was fined a few days ago, uh, some millions, I think, in the Gauteng province, you know, for discharging um, water that is not compliant. But you said your river is most polluted. I don't think we have ever gone to the Val. I think we have been said that's the most polluted catchment in the world because mines are discharging there, farmers are discharging there. All these people need to be, uh, you know, regulated. But if there's no implementation of the law, anybody does what they want. So it's an issue of economy versus environment. <laughs> You see, not that municipalities are reckless or farmers are reckless, but whenever they're not doing the right thing, you must call them into action. When the municipalities don't do the right thing, you must call them into action. But the situation is dire to an extent that our treatment works are dysfunctional. You know, so I said to example to him yesterday, it's like flocking a dead horse. You know, you're finding me, but my plant is not working, it's in and out. So we need to invest in new technologies, invest in skills, invest in a lot of things to ensure that our treatment, wastewater treatment as a country functions optimally. I hope I've answered him. Yeah, but if you want to discuss more, please let's do it over lunch. I hope I won't make you not to enjoy your lunch, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ashton. Can we take one more question? Short one, short response, then we can, uh, I can conclude and we can take it from there. No, no, no further questions for this uh, for this session. No further questions on, on on the online session, online platform at least. None. I just want to make a statement. One or two, we can take it to the lunch and talk about it. There are two names that appeared on Ashton's presentation. It was the Warwick wines and the Durbanville wines. I'm going to make the statement, but it's actually just to project in the greatest place of industry. So us as an NCPC, we funded by the DTIC. Our mandate is to assist companies in improving their resource efficiency. But in doing that, we hope for the company to become more competitive. Yeah? If you can increase your, uh, your, uh, uh, your bottom line as, an, as a company, in, uh, make it much more profitable because you in, you're saving on water resource, then it means you can actually sell your product. I'll get to you in a minute, sir. Then, then you can sell your product at a more competitive price. Am I right? At the end of the day, that is what business uh, model is all about. Not all companies are, are kind enough to do that, but some companies, they need that marketing. They need to save that resource in order to market the product, in order to tell the world, I'm now compliant from a water point of view or efficient from a water point of view. I can now sell my product for 10% less. Can you come to the shop and buy it? Those two companies in particular, I buy the odd occasion of red wine. Warwick's red wine has gone on a special quite a few times, even in expensive shops like Woolworths. They are go going at very competitive prices and it's a very good quality wine. Durbanville Hills as well. And you don't see the other guys necessarily. I'm not an ambassador for them. I'm just saying from a consumer point of view. And when I hear the story that Ashton is telling whereby they are taking now the uh, grey water and putting it on the lawn, when you go to a place like Warwick in Cape Town at a time like this, uh, the, the lawn is absolutely incredible. So that method of this is working. I was there a month ago for a picnic with my wife. So all of these resource savings and re resource in in uh, initiatives that we are uh, undertaking, it has secondary knock-on knock effects that we are blind to. Uh, whether it's uh, blind to it uh, uh, um, by intention or not. Um, so there's really great spin-offs that come from the fact that if you do a, 
a water management, good water management system that they are very, uh, very much added benefits to, to your company bottom line, but also from a marketing point of view, you can sell your product and, and market it at, at different levels. That's all I want to say. We can elaborate on that at, uh, during lunch. Sir, la last question, short response, and we're going to take it uh, and conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Rendani here from Nafasi Water. I was going to make them questions, but I'll make them comments so that we can run with them. <clears throat> the first one, I think it was from the first speaker. There was a, um, a comment around lack of policy implementation, which appears to be a national issue. Um, I've just finished my PhD on innovation policy. And part of the thing that um, I think is quite important is we are very quick to just say that there's lack of uh, policy implementation. But we don't seem to be doing enough to understand what is causing the lack of policy implementation. It just becomes a blanket statement. So my challenge will be, at least from a water point of view, let's understand what, what exactly is causing what in not having the policy implementation so that we're able to address it. Otherwise, if we just say it's lack of policy implementation, unfortunately, we are never going to solve anything. So I just think it's important that as part of this studies of which I think the likes of Green Cape can also get involved in. Let's understand what is causing what in the ecosystem so that we are able to go in and block that particular bot bottleneck so that the implementation can actually uh, take place. My other question was around, but as I said, it's a comment now. The terms and conditions of the international funding partners from an intellectual property ownership point of view and what the implications are for the likes of Nafasi Water if we are interested in facilitating the commercialization of such technologies. Because I did pick up, um, I think from the first presentation in terms of, um, I think the IFC, I think you also spoke about the Danish trip. There was also another, I know, I know GIZ is also here from a Germany point of view. And the question is, and I'm, I'm saying this as well because I had a, we had two conversations in the last two weeks as Nafasi Water with um, international funding partners and technology transfer potential partners. and. The conversation around intellectual property ownership and sharing, especially when there's localization of which I know the CSR does a lot of work on localization of which you actually create new novelty. The question is who owns what? And I'm, I'm not sure if those things are clear because they could delay uh, or whatever commercialization work that we're trying to do from a technology adoption point of view. And then to you, Che, you were quite delighted with what you experienced when you were in 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 Denmark around the how the companies are approaching water. And even there, I think we must ask ourselves, how did those relationships arrive there? Why have we not arrived there? Instead of doing that comparison and saying that South Africa is not doing it, we need to ask ourselves, what, what have they done? So this aspect of the causal loop is quite important. Otherwise, then we never understand what exactly we, we never actually take the lesson, and I think South Africa is one country that has traveled to other countries a lot. I mean, recently the Minister of Science and Innovation was at Silicon Valley. We make a lot of these trips, but if we don't understand what we are learning in those trips, then it's very difficult to interpret them back. And part of it might be we just say, oh yeah, I see these things nice, I don't see it in South Africa. But the question is, why does it exist there? And he spoke about case studies, and that's the veil of case studies that when you interpret it back, you're then able to do that. But as I said, I will have made them questions, but they're now comments, but it's for things to think about. Otherwise, then we will not be able to move our, our ecosystem forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the three comments. Uh, I'm, I'm so saddened by the fact that we have to end the session now, because what is raised, the, the three very beautiful points. One sentence, then we conclude. It's very important that when we go overseas and we want to come back and tell the good story that we do so within context. Because, and, and, and equally so when, when, when those guys on the other side of the, the continent, when they tell the story, there also needs to be the context of how, how it is that they are doing it in, in such a great manner. Water is costing the Danish people about 180 rands per cubic meter, uh, 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 cubic meter, yeah, which is a, 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 a ton of water. Uh, in South Africa, it's costing us how much for a cubic meter of water? It's costing us like under 10 rand, uh, 5 rand, 6 rand, 7 rand. Uh, can you now compare and say that, uh, you know, the Danish are doing things great and we respect them, but the model that they are doing 
it has evolved from one point to the next and they are paying for it and they are do, uh, doing a great job. But you cannot just simply take the model and come here and duplicate it and not give it context. So everything is within context. Um, I want to end there. I want to say thank you. We started off very quietly. Uh, we almost went to a sprint. Um, one three quarter way through, we went at the sprint, and we I could see that there was very interactive uh, participation, yeah, and remotely. So I'm officially ending the session, and I do thank you, and I think the thank the participants from the remote platform as well. Uh, we are closed now, uh, and enjoy the lunch. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.